Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two for our scripture reading today. We're going to read verses nineteen through twenty-three. Second Timothy chapter two, verses nineteen through twenty-three, and we read the verses responsibly. We begin together on nineteen, then I read twenty, and together on twenty-one, alternating until we end on verse twenty-three. Second Timothy chapter two. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin on verse nineteen, Second Timothy chapter two. Ready? Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand as sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today, and uh, we have enjoyed singing praises to you. And Lord, we're asking that uh, you would quiet our hearts and that you would help us to be prepared to receive your word today. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for preserving your words for us, that we can hold copies of the word of God in our hand today. And I pray that you would help us each to listen carefully to what you would want to say to each of us this morning. I pray your blessing now on the special as it's given. May it tune our hearts with your heart. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I carried a burden of staggering weight and struggled for freedom but could not escape. I trembled and cried at the thought of my feet. What must I do to be saved? I desperately searched for release from my pain, but found that man's wisdom was useless and vain. Is there not a power that can break every chain? What must I do to be saved? Jesus' blood flows from Calvary, breaking Satan's bar, setting captives free. Greatest gift of the greatest love. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. I saw Jesus bleeding the cross for his sin. The men standing by were all mocking his pain. But then, yes, I heard it, he called out my name. Kneel at the cross and received. I fell at the feet of the one hanging there. Oh, Savior, forgive me, I cried in despair. My burden fell off, Jesus answered my prayer. Kneel at the cross and be saved. Jesus' blood flows from Calvary, breaking Satan's power, setting captives free. Greatest gift of the greatest love, heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. Amen. 
That's right. Now, our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer, and Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity for us to be here this morning. We're asking you to minister to us through your word today. Thank you for each one that's made their way here today, and Lord, I'm praying that you would move up and down the aisle and in and out of each row and minister to every occupied seat here today, that no one would miss what you want to say to them today through your word. Help me as I bring the message to uh, say what needs to be said and to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. Lord, I pray that you'll help us all today to be vessels of honor unto you. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, if your Bible is open there, Paul is instructing Timothy and he's using an illustration for him to tell him in verse number 19 that, in fact, verse number 20, that there's a great house. And in this great house, there are vessels uh, that the owner of the house will use. Uh, in your home, you have vessels. Uh, we call them glasses in America that you might choose to drink something out of or a vessel you may use to hold different kinds of liquid. You may have something that you put salad dressing in. You may have something you put gravy in. Uh, you may have something that you put salsa in. But they're all different kinds of vessels that you have at your disposal that you use in your home. And he says, Timothy, we are vessels in God's house. We are just simply containers that God wants to use. Okay, now he mentions in this house there's vessels, containers if you will, vessels of gold and silver and also wood and of earth. And that's not the issue. The issue isn't whether they're wood or earth or whether they're gold or silver. Some of you will have certain vessels in your home that only come out on special occasions. And that's okay. He's not diminishing that. It's, it's not, uh, some of you guys may have your favorite cup that you pull out when you're going to watch a ball game or something. And, um, you know, you pull out the, the 44 ouncer or whatever it is. It's going to last you for four quarters. And, and you, uh, you watch the ball game. But that's not the, that's not the cup. Boy, if I ever set that cup out on the dinner table when we're having company over, my wife would have a heart attack and uh, say, get that cup out of here. That's not for company, you know. And, and it's, it's just the vessel. It doesn't matter whether it's wood or the gold or the silver. Is it usable? Is it usable? That's what Paul is getting across to Timothy. Notice what he said. There's some of those vessels to honor and some are to dishonor. Now, if a man purge himself from these, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, he'll be a vessel unto honor. Notice, sanctified. Sanctify means set apart. Meet means suitable. So we're set apart and suitable for the master's use and prepared for every good work. The issue isn't whether you're, whether you're a wooden one or earthen one or whether you're a gold or a silver vessel. The, the important thing is, are you a vessel that the master can use? Are you a vessel that is set apart and suitable, meet for the master to use you for every good purpose that he desires to use us? I don't know about you, I want to be a vessel that God can use. That's all. Uh, there's no... There's no uh, the vessel doesn't take any credit. The vessel can The vessel just a container. And we just want to be filled with God so He can use us. And that's what Paul is exhorting Timothy to do here. Now, if we're going to be used by God, if we're going to be a vessel God can use, then three things must take place. All right? And, and this, is what, this is the crux of the message here today. Notice the first thing that has to happen is we have to flee. We have to flee. You notice verse 22? He tells Timothy, flee also youthful lusts. We have to flee. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 11, Paul wrote this, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. And he's talking about money, the love of money, and the love of material things, and the love of the things of this world. And he's reminding Timothy, you're going to have to flee these things. There's times when running away is a sign of being a coward. 
Okay? When, when they made fun of Nehemiah rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, he said, should such a man as I flee? He's saying, I'm not running away from this fight. God's called me to do something and I'm going to stand and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to be afraid of any, any opposition. So understand that. But there are other times when fleeing is a mark of wisdom and a mark of victory. When Joseph fled from the advances of Potiphar's wife, that was victory. That was, that was a time <clears throat> of wisdom for him. When, when David fled, when King Saul tried to nail him to the wall with a javelin, that's a good thing. And that was a good time to flee and get out of the presence of Saul. So, when, when he talks here about fleeing, it can mean running, but it also can mean this. It means to avoid something. To stay away from something. When he says, you flee, youthful us, he's saying avoid and stay away from it. Now, in the context here, he's talking about some of the false teachers. If you look up in verse number 16, it says, Shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. He's saying these are false teachers, Timothy, and you've got to avoid them. You need to stay away from them. When, when they do not preach or teach the truth, do not give them an ear. Avoid those kind of people and stay away from them. But then also, you notice you, it says you flee youthful lust. Now you think, well, Timothy must have been a kid. No, Timothy was between 30 and 40 when he received this letter from Paul. All right? Now, understand, the older I get, 30 and 40 seems awful young. All right? Understand that. Uh, but I don't consider a 30 or 40 year old a youth. All right? Uh, considered teenagers youth, and uh, maybe somebody who might be uh, 18, 19, 20 still youth, uh, but I don't consider a 30 to 40 year old man a youth anymore. Sorry about that, Andy. And um, yeah, <laughs> and and we don't look at them that way. And so I think uh, when at that age, um, it's not the necessarily the. The, the youthful lust that is the issue here, uh, though we ought to flee fornication and flee uh, 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 the immorality that would uh, mark the youth, but I think when you get to 30 and 40, it's more of a lust for ambition, power, position, moving up in the world and being somebody and being known for something. And he's saying, be careful I think someone said carnal pleasures are the sins of youth, ambition and love of power, the sins of middle age, and covetousness and worry, the crimes of old age. Pretty accurate. So there are things that God is saying basically this, if I want to be a vessel that's used of God, there's some things I've got to stay away from. There's some things I've got to avoid. Psalm 1 in the Bible says, Blessed is the man. What's blessed mean? Happy. Happy is the man. And he gives three things to avoid. He says that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He said there's three things you've got to avoid if you're going to be happy in the Lord. If you're going to be happy as a Christian, then you have to flee the counsel of the ungodly, standing with sinners, and sitting in the seat of the scornful. The scornful are those who are critical. Always, always seeing the negative in things. Always seeing something wrong, not seeing anything right. And then mocking and making fun of people. He says, you've got to avoid that because your delight, verse 2 of Psalm 1, is your delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law do you meditate day and night. Now, you'll never do verse 2 if you don't get verse 1. You'll never be able to meditate and, and meditate in God's Word if you're walking in the counsel of ungodly and standing in the way of sinners and sitting in the seat of the scornful. In fact, 1 John 2 and verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And God's saying, so you've got to flee those things. The Bible says in the parable of the sower, when the sower uh, sowed the seed on the stony soil that, that uh, the uh, weeds came up and it choked the word. And, and the Bible says those weeds were the cares of this world. And we get caught up in just the cares of the world. And you know what it does? It chokes the word out of our life. We get up and we say, oh man, I've got to get going. I've got this to do. I've got things, places to go, things to do, people to see. <laughs> I've got to get hit it, hit it hard. No, wait, 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 wait. No, you need God first. You need time with God first. You need to make sure that the word has its place in its life. And so you have to say no to some things in order to have the word of God to have its place in your life. You know, Isabella of Spain bragged that she had had only two baths in her lifetime. I'm not sure why you'd brag about that, but she bragged about it. She said one when she was born and the other when she married Ferdinand. I'm sure Ferdinand was thankful. But she said, they, they, and then the history says they gave her a third when she died. If, if that's true, I wouldn't want to be around Isabella very long, okay? Uh, in fact, there was a, not too long ago, there was, a real, there was a real case of this on an airplane. Did you see that? Where some, somebody really stunk? And uh, did you remember seeing that article? And, and that people couldn't already say it. It was really horrible, and it's true. I think that person died a few weeks later. They had something wrong with them. And uh, the stench was so horrible. I, I couldn't imagine. You know, an airplane, you're, you're sitting rather close. Okay? Airplanes were not designed with guys like me in mind. Okay? They were designed like for people like uh, Bowman. That's who they were designed for, okay? Pencil, pencil guys, you know, and uh, you, you get 18 inches, you know what I mean? 18 inches is my right leg, all right? And, uh, you know, you, you get, I, I had to laugh when, we, when I flew out to Mexico for the mission trip from here to Atlanta. They changed my seat. I had an aisle seat, and I rung my thing, my pass in and, and a little ticket came up and they said oh Mr. Slayball wait and they gave it to me and it wasn't 31C anymore it was 35A or something like that now I'm by the window so I have to go in and sit by the window you know the thing curves up you know what I mean <laughs> sitting I guess and then there's a there's an empty seat and then a guy a guy where's Fred Messer a guy like Fred Messer sitting in the aisle seat so it's okay we got a middle seat between us well, that wasn't too bad until Rob, Rob, put your hand up. Rob got on the plane. Rob takes the middle seat. I, I kid you not, he got in, he got in, and, and it wasn't Rob, you know, a guy his size. And he got in, he, he, he went, and he went down and he went. And he sat like that all the way to Atlanta. Never moved. And there's three of us in here, you know. Are you buckled in? Are you kidding me? We were wedged in, man. You'd... The whole plane could have disintegrated and there would have been three guys sitting there like this, you know? I don't know. The good thing was he smelled good, okay? He didn't smell bad. I, I don't know where that came from, but that must have been about smelling good, all right? Now the truth is, None of us, none of us like to be around people that don't smell good. Nothing more difficult than to be close to someone who's got a bad smell. Now you understand something. You know what makes the Christian smell? is sin. You say, well, other people don't smell it. God does. God does. And when we allow sin in our life and we think it's okay, God moves away from us because we stink. And if you, if you pull that vessel out of the cupboard and, you, hear, and you, you get a smell coming from it, this needs to be washed again. This needs some help. You don't say, oh, well, once I put my, you know, uh, once you put your Coke in there, it probably wouldn't matter. But, you know, once you, once you put your drink in there, it'll be all right. No, it won't. 
you would not use that. Okay? It, it stinks. And you have to understand, that makes us unusable by God if we will not flee those things that make us stink in His sight. We have to be separate. We have to be sanctified. We have to be set apart. Flee those things. Don't, you know, sometimes people always ask the question, well, you know, can I do this and still be a Christian? Or can I do this and still be a... You're asking the wrong question. What we're trying to say is, you know, what can I do? How, 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 close, how close to doing wrong can I get and still be okay? But the question should be, how close can I get to God? Will, will this bring me closer to God or will this take me further away from God? You know what happens when you walk on the edge too long? You fall over. And bad things happen. And so don't, don't, don't think about how, <clears throat> focus on how close I can get to God, not how far away I can be from God and still be okay. So we have to flee some things. The second word that we want to spend some time with today is in verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord of your heart. Second uh, thing we do is we follow. <clears throat> we have some things to follow. Now we're fleeing some things, but we're not just running away from the wrong. We're not just running away from temptation. We're not just running away from sin. We are pursuing something else. We are following. Pursuing is the word. It's a very strong word. It means to run after, to run swiftly after. It means to hotly pursue. It has the idea, I'm coming after you until I overtake you. I'm not just running to keep the pace of the distance. I'm running to overtake you. I'm going to catch you. That's the pursuit that we have. Now, <clears throat> notice what it says he's to pursue. It says, first of all, you pursue righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness is simply right living. It's conforming my life to the laws of God. And by the way, you, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't do that. You may do that for a little bit, but you won't con continue to be able to do it. Because you, none of us can keep the laws of God. None of us in our power and our strength can keep what God has commanded. You know why? The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short. We will all fall short of the glory of God. None of us can make it. None of us can attain it. So the first, when we pursue righteousness, we have to understand the first righteousness we have has to come from Jesus Christ. He's the only one that has righteousness. He's the only one who can say, I do always the things that please Him. And so when you receive Christ your Savior, Christ comes to live in you. See, now you have His righteousness. When, when I trusted Christ as my Savior, that He died on the cross for me, that He paid my sin debt, and I ask Him to be my Savior, when God looks down at Stan Slayball, He sees Jesus Christ. See, I go to heaven not because I have righteousness, but because Jesus lives in me. I go to heaven on the righteousness of Jesus Christ because you and I don't have righteousness. The Bible says prior to Jesus Christ, without Christ, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. They don't mean a thing. They don't mean a thing. You have to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. So then, then I pursue, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to hotly pursue living right, living the way God says I'm to live. And God gives us the ability to do that with the presence of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to seek to obey Him and obey His Word. That's what I desire to do. God, God gives you those desires when you come to know Jesus. Uh, before, I know there, there are people in here this morning, you know, you, before you came to know Christ, you never read the Bible. You didn't care what the Bible said. It wasn't a, I mean, it didn't have any pictures in it. Why do I want to look at it? But now that you got saved, there's a, there's a desire that comes to know, I want to read the Bible. You say, man, where'd that come from? That came from Jesus Christ. That came from the Holy Spirit of God who came into you when you accepted Christ as your Savior. Your desires change. 
So I just can't ever see myself living like a Christian. Well, it's because you don't live by sight, you live by faith. Okay? And don't you don't have to see it, you just have to believe it. And God will reward your faith. So he says, follow righteousness, but then the very next thing is faith. Faith is trust. Faith is taking God at his word. That's all, all it is. It's, it's, faith is always a measurement of the confidence that I have in God. It's, it's always a check on the uh, measurement of how much confidence I have in God. That's faith. And, and so I'm going to learn to trust God. The centurion we talked about last week who had his servant healed. And remember when Jesus was on his way and he sent friends out to stop him and say, I'm not worthy to come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. You don't even have to be here. And remember Jesus marveled at him and he said, I've not seen so great faith. Somebody who has that much confidence in me and confidence in my word that I can just speak the word and his servant will be healed. And his servant was healed from that hour. Faith. Faith. Confidence in God. Then, <clears throat> righteousness, faith. Third one is charity. Charity is love, but it goes beyond love. Love is when I willingly and sacrificially will give myself for someone else with no thought of return. Willingly, sacrificially give myself for someone else with no thought of return. That's love. Now, I can do that and not like you. I can do that and not have any feelings for you. You understand? That's why the Bible says you can love your enemy. Because the Bible says when you love your enemy, if he hungers, what are you supposed to do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's naked or needs clothing, give him something to wear. He's saying you can love your enemy because you can meet his needs. You can willingly, sacrificially give it yourself to, to, for his benefit and not expect anything in return. But I don't have to like him. But charity means I will willingly, sacrificially give myself for the benefit of someone else and I desire the best for them. I have feelings. I want the best. That's why in 1 Corinthians 13, when it uses charity, it says it, it doesn't think any evil. It, it hopes all things, believes all things. It wants the best for that person. And that's what charity is. And so when you, you begin to pursue that I want the best for people, I don't want to see bad things happen to anybody. I really don't. And God says we should be pursuing that charity. I think favorably of you. I think the best of you. That's charity. And then last one is peace. We're following righteousness, faith, charity, and then peace. Peace is being uh, safe from harm in spirit, soul, and body. No fear of harm coming. Free from disturbance or agitation. The Bible says seek peace and ensue it or pursue it. Pursue the things that, that will give you that peace in your heart. The Bible says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Don't pursue the things that interrupt the peace. Don't pursue things that are going to bring agitation and going to bring uh, disturbance into your life. Now, look at those four things again. Righteousness, faith, charity, peace. You know where you find all those things? You find all those things in Jesus Christ. You find all that He's our righteousness. He is, he is our faith. Our faith is in Him. He is our um, uh, charity. He's the one we love, and He loves us, and has things favorable towards us, and He's our peace. He's the Prince of Peace. So what is He saying, Timothy? You, you flee the things that, that is sinful, you flee the things of this world, and I want you to pursue Jesus Christ. Pursue Him. Make it your passion to be like Him. That's why Jesus continually, whenever He called His disciples, whenever He talked to them, when, when He called them to, to come after Him, you know what two words He always used? Follow me. 
follow me. Matthew, follow me. Andrew, follow me. Peter and James, follow me. You know what he says to you and me this morning? Follow me. We follow Jesus Christ. We're pursuing Him. Now, I want you to look at Luke chapter 6 with me, would you please? Luke chapter 6. You doing all right? Okay, Luke chapter 6. Look with me at verse number 39. Luke 6, verse 39. Jesus, the Bible says here in verse 39, He, that's Jesus, spake a parable unto them. Here it is. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Can a blind lead a blind? No. Now, again, think about their day. We're not talking about our day, but you're not talking about a, having a dog and one guy maybe have his dog, the other guy doesn't. No. In those days, if you were blind, the only way you're going to get around is if somebody with sight leads you. If you're both blind, you're both going to fall into the ditch. Okay? So... So, think about this with me. It's foolish to allow somebody to lead me that is as blind as I am. Or has the same blind spot that I do. Or the same weakness that I do. It's important to follow Jesus Christ because we become like the ones we follow. You will not be what you want to be. You will be like those you choose to follow. You'll be like who you choose to follow. That's who you'll be like. That's why it's dangerous to buddy up with someone in our addictions program with someone who has the same addiction as you. We have seen it happen that then when there's a weak moment, they both indulge in their addiction. Why? That's a blind trying to lead the blind. See, somebody says, well, I don't think I can talk to this person because they've never had my addiction. That's exactly the one you need to talk to. You know why? Because they're not blind. And you won't fall into the ditch if you follow them. Boy, that's quiet in here, isn't it? Why would I pair up with someone who has the same blindness as me? If I was blind, I want to team up with someone who can see and see where I'm going and lead me on the right path. What? The path of pursuing Jesus Christ. That goes back to Psalm 1. I'm not going to walk in the counsel of someone who doesn't love God. They're not going to help me to pursue Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to do. I'm not only fleeing, I'm following. That's why when, when Jesus, in, in Hebrews 12, it says when we run the race that sets before us, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't get your eyes on people. People will disappoint you. I, I don't want to discourage a new Christian in the room. I, 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 if you've just been saved for a few months or maybe a year. How many in the room have been saved for 10 years or more? Let me see your hand. 10 years or more you've known Christ, all right? How many in 10 years or more have said, had Christian people disappoint you? Just about every hand. And by the way, most of us could probably raise our hand and say, I'm sure I've disappointed some Christians <laughs> during that time. I've been on the other end, and, and I've been the cause of disappointment. That's why the Bible never says, run with race and keep looking at each other. It doesn't say that. It says, better keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the one we're following because, notice verse 40, 
Everyone that is perfect, that means fully instructed, because it's talking about the, the teacher and the pupil here. Everyone that is perfect or fully instructed will be as his teacher. You're going to be just like the one who teaches you. And I want to be like Christ. And so we follow him. So we have flee and we have follow. And then third one, I want you to miss this. Go to, again to 2 Timothy chapter 22. Here's our, here's our third word, our final word. Flee also youthful lust, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Notice the next two words. We're following righteousness, faith, charity, peace. What's the next two words, church? With them. With them. That call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The third word is fellowship. Flee, follow, and fellowship. With them. I'm fleeing youthful us. I'm fleeing the things that would keep me from pursuing Christ. I'm pursuing Christ, but I don't do it alone. I'm not by myself. God never intended that you live for Christian life on your own and by yourself. He said with them, with others who are also pursuing Christ. We're not in the battle alone. There's others here that can help us. And we're in the race not to compete with each other, but to encourage each other, to help one another. If somebody falls, we help them up. If somebody stumbles, we pull them up. We bring them aside. We're here to encourage and exhort each other to keep on looking unto Jesus and keep on pursuing Him. How important it is that we spend time with one another. You spend time with other believers that are in the same pursuit as you're in. That are running the same race that you're running. That's why we gather together to encourage each other and to study the Bible together and to pray one for another. It's very, very important. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. I see it all the time. Uh, folks, they, they, they get away from church, they get away from other believers, and you know what happens inevitably? Satan gets them. The, 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 the wolf always looks for the sheep that wanders away from the flock. He's the easy target. And then guess, when that happens, and they're in hard times, and, and the difficulties are here, who do they call? They call the church. They call the family they should have been a part of in the first place. And had they never left, they wouldn't have had the difficulty. You understand? You, you've got to have with them. With them. God never intended that you just be out there all by yourself. You know, sheep, sheep don't, uh, sheep have nothing to fight with. Sheep don't fight. Sheep have no, they have no defense, they have no offense, they, they're just sheep. That's why they're such easy targets. <clears throat> I read this this week. It stuck in my mind. That's why, you know, you know who fight? Sheep don't fight. You know who fight? Goats fight. Goats have horns. So uh, the guy was writing and said, so if there's problems in your church with people fighting, it's probably not the sheep, it's the goats. Ooh. Ouch. Huh? So understand, uh, you... Where's sheep safety? The sheep safety is in staying close to the shepherd. If we're not close to the shepherd, you're in danger. And shepherd, listen, the shepherd keeps the flock. If you want to stay, you're not going to be close to the shepherd if you're not close with the flock. Because that's where the shepherd is. See, you need the flock. You need the security of the flock. Fellowship. I want to be around those who love God. I want to be around those who want to serve God. I want to be around the people that are 
that are pursuing Jesus Christ. They're pursuing righteousness and faith and charity and peace. Because those who love the Lord will help me to love the Lord. They'll help me to serve the Lord. You need the fellowship of other believers. He goes on in verse 23 to say this. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing they do gender strifes. When you look back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, just turn back a couple pages there. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4, familiar, almost the same thing. He tells Timothy, Neither give heed to fables, and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Timothy, don't get off track. Timothy, don't get caught up in things that don't matter. There's always questions and things that people can bring up just to cause a question just to cause a division, and that really doesn't matter. And so be, be aware of that. The Christian life is, you have to decide what teachers you're going to follow. You have to decide who you're going to listen to. And then you decide, am I going to be a vessel unto honor to God? D.L. Moody said, God doesn't seek for golden vessels. He doesn't ask for silver ones but he must have clean ones. That's you and me. I just want God to use me as a vessel. Timothy, you're going to be a preacher. You're going to preach the Word and be instant in season, out of season. But Timothy, I want you to remember you're a vessel for God. Be a vessel that's used by God. Flee the things that are wrong. Flee the things that God says you need to avoid and stay away from so you can pursue Christ. You lay aside, Hebrews says, we lay aside the sin and the weight, the things that easily beset us, and we follow Christ. We pursue Him. You know what we're doing at Bible Baptist Church? We're just pursuing Jesus Christ trying to pursue Him. And we encourage each other to do the same. He's the one that we follow. And we do it together. Fellowship with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There's a song that says, To be used of God to sing, to speak, to pray. To be used of God to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of His consuming fire. To be used of God is my desire. I hope that's your desire this morning as well. And listen carefully. If you're here today and you say, well, I don't know about God using me. I'm not even sure I know God. My friend, the only way you know God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Savior, then we'd love to show you how you can know Him as your Savior. We have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. In a few moments, they'll show you how you can have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Best decision you ever make in your life. The most important decision you'll ever make in your life is to settle the fact, where will I go when I die? I just opened up the, uh, my email this morning and on I have Yahoo and on the front page of Yahoo there's a beautiful family on the front cover there some of you may have seen it a mother I think there were four girls they're coming back from a vacation somewhere in New Jersey a guy on the interstate crossed the median and hit them head on mom's the only survivor Girls were burnt beyond recognition. Young girls. They had no idea their life would be over that day. None. So it's, it's, don't boast yourself of tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring forth. Make, if I was certain of anything, 
I'd make certain I was saved. I'd make certain that I was going to heaven. And God will give you that guarantee. And I trust you'll let us show you that this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention this morning. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be vessels in your house. And Lord, we want to be vessel unto honor, not a vessel unto dishonor. We don't want to be set aside, unsuitable for you to use. I'd like you to use, use us as vessels for the Master's use, however you want to use us, Lord. We just want to be used by God. Help us to flee what we need to flee. Help us to follow, pursue Jesus Christ. And help us to fellowship. Help us to do it together. Help us to do it with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many of you here this morning would say, Pastor, if I died this morning, I know 100% sure that I would go to heaven. There's no doubt in my mind. If God stopped me at heaven and said, why would I let you into heaven? I would tell them I've trusted Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. And so, Pastor, I'm confident, based on the Word of God, that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know that for sure. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I can't with confidence say, I know if I take my last breath here or if that somebody runs the red light going home today and hits me head on and I go into eternity. I can't really say that I know I'm going to heaven. But Pastor, I'd like to know that and I'm sure you would. Would you let me pray for you? If you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Would you let me pray for you? Would you just slip your hand up right now and put it back down and say, Pastor, I'm not sure. Pray for me this morning. Would you do that today? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Join this. Say, pray for me, Pastor. Just put it up. You couldn't raise it the first time, but you'll raise it now. Will you do it? I wonder how many Christians here today would say, Preacher, I want to be a vessel that God can use. I want to flee what I ought to flee. Follow, pursue Jesus Christ and do it in fellowship with other believers. Pastor, I just want to be used by God. A vessel suitable, fit for the Master's use. Pastor, God spoke to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart today. The altar is open for you to come and pray. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, Christians will be coming to pray. When they come to pray, you come. I'll be at the front. You take my hand. And I'll have someone take a Bible. They'll take you to a private place. And they'll show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Oh, don't walk out the doors without being sure of that. Christian, whatever it is that God spoke to your heart about, obey Him today. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts this morning. Thank You for decisions that have been made already for You as You've spoken to our hearts. Allow us to be vessels that will be used by You. I pray for those in the room who are not certain if they died, they'd go to heaven, that they would come and let someone help them with that. I'd like them to walk out the door in a few moments with that confidence in their heart that if anything happens to them, they'll wake up in heaven. So Lord, have your way now in this invitation in each and every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it.